Okay, what's up? Summer has arrived to Sweden. That is pretty amazing. So I brought my computer up to the house and uh, now I don't have it here. No battery in it, so it makes no sense to get it here. But yeah, that means that I'm gonna have to do this, hopefully, with just a phone. That should work though. So let me know if something is screwed up because I can't really view stuff in a fashion that I usually do. So I was just watching here. So Maddie Hapoya had done a video on being unique is impossible. Let me just see what he, he wrote. So this is part of the new segment because it was on F-stoppers. I thought I'd just... Uh, do some form of like elaboration or response to Maddie. Uh, hi, Maddie. <laughs> we'll probably see each other soon. Um, yeah. So, how to find your style? Now, this is a huge topic. Everybody uh, is asking themselves this as some like at different stages in your career. Uh, and I think Matty is like spot on when he talks about like being unique is impossible. Um, and how do you find your style? And I don't play it down as much as Matty does. Because uh, I think it's crucial if you want to elevate your career uh, to the kind of next level. It's, it really is like a crucial thing to find your style or develop your style. Um, but being unique that is pretty difficult and yeah impossible everybody takes inspiration from stuff uh, and uh, like in the beginning everybody starts off uh, creating stuff that is copying other people that's what everybody does you start off creating things that is uh, trying to mimic what inspires you people that inspire you uh, and for me like i everybody oops me I just need to pause. So for me, like what I looked at in the beginning in terms of like inspiration, a lot of it was like the context that I was in. So you look at like Swedish filmmakers, like Roy Anderson uh, was a massive inspiration to me. Uh, who else? Like Bo Wiedeberg was a huge inspiration to me. But then also photographers like Martina Huglan Ivanov was a huge inspiration in terms of like how to make a photo or something look um, like cinematic, magical, moody and all that. Um, that style, I love her photography. It's amazing like how she processes the images. So you take all those things. Like I watched a lot of like, what did I like? What type of films did I like? I liked like Jim Jarmusch movies. I like uh, Larry Clark movies. I like Harmony Korine movies. Um, Gus Van Sant. Like all these really slow kind of human stories. But also a mix of like other stuff. Like Roy Anderson is a super stylistic type of director. Much more in like a... Like a super weird and quirky type of uh, depressing uh, movie making. But I take inspiration from all of those. And nowadays I don't watch many of them anymore. Because you take all these things from these people. So from, uh, for instance, Ro Robert Rodriguez, who did like El Mariachi, wrote a book about it. Uh, which I know I've recommended before. He inspired me massively to try to find my way of making films. So how do you want to make films? What process do you have for making films? That's like a huge aspect of finding your style is to find what process lends itself to how I want to make films. For me, it was documentary. That was like uh, the place where I felt most uh, naturally in terms of telling a story. So working with real people, real stories, I didn't feel it becoming predictable. So that was one way of like, okay, so that defines, like that's the limitation I have. Okay, how do you go on from that? How do you go on from like, okay, so first of all, I don't like working with actors. I think it's, it, it rarely creates as good result as you would get with amateurs. 
so first that was one thing that dictated my style another thing was that i was a photographer from the beginning and like a stillist photographer i liked a certain type of like composition post-processing all that i came from working with film for a while uh, both like 60 millimeter but mostly still photography 35 millimeter stills and uh, 120 millimeter uh, films uh, and that look is something that I want to have in what I create. It comes from me having lived that, going through that, liking that organic feel. And then that all that matches up with your inspiration. So you like these types of films, you like this type of music, you like this type of uh, style, you like to live on the countryside, you like to be climbing mountains, you like to be sporting, you like to do whatever it is. Those things also emphasizes your style. So you take all of those personal things that is your life and that's what you put into your style. Whatever that is, you put in the stuff that you like into your style. That's how you become a style. So you define your style by mashing everything together in the blender. It comes out on the other side and you got your style. And for me, it probably also comes from like Scandinavian. Like the Scandinavian part of me is like a massive part of the style because Scandinavia is dark, it's moody, <laughs> it's like it's cold, it's depressing most of the year. Uh, and that lends itself to a more moody and uh, mellow type of feel. And that's what I think my style has in it. Um, but then I'm also like, I like fun movies, I like having fun, uh, like I'm a happy type of guy. Uh, so that's also something that I try to get into the stuff that I do. But it's easy to be like one dimensional and only like, as, as you start out, it's easy to just become one thing, so one style. So you can only create like moody stuff. And then that's what you become. I like to mash stuff together, so I like to have like, a mix of everything. Um, if I can, I want to have you know happy moments. I want to have depressing moments. I want to have people going through a roller coaster in terms of feelings, and that also comes into style in the end. Like, what type of stories do you tell? What type of shots do you uh, portray them uh, through? And uh, also the scenes that you create are they funny? Like Roy Anderson scenes, which a lot of people just think is weird and stupid and and dumb and and like pretentious and I love that type of humor like it's the Finnish humor that like Aki Karismaki who's like an amazing director he also uses the same type of uh, absurdity and that's what I think it is like it's an absurd humor that a lot of people don't really get uh, but when you get it and when you love it you really love it and that's what I try to incorporate also in the stuff that I make like some form of um, I guess I don't like, like I love watching Louis C.K. And, and that type of dark humor, but I can't do that. I'm not a comedian. But what I like is to have like the, the sarcasm be part of what I do. And that comes into composition and those things as well. So also how I edit things. It is a part of the style that you create. And certain people will get that just from like the, the nuances of it. You don't have to explain it to people and they will still get it. But certain people won't get it at all. And you just have to kind of find your style and find your way in, in all of that. And yeah, that's a long elaboration of all that regarding style and everything. But yeah, for me, that's like a huge thing. Like finding your style is crucial if you want to get paid. <laughs> It's crucial. That's how you stand out. It really is. Uh, and if you don't have a style, you oh, shouldn't be you just have to kind of discouraged. It's like a, a crucial thing to take the next step to separate yourself from other people. But your style will be similar to other people. So I'm probably similar to a lot of people in terms of style and stuff. But then you have different nuances that only I can mix things together in a certain way. And when you find that, when you find what you like and you find what types of stuff that you really enjoy seeing and making, then that becomes your style. Uh, and for me, that's something that I feel comfortable with now. Like, I really think that everything I make from now will be pretty definite in terms of like how it will be. It, of course, will change depending on what kind of 
experiences what kind of life you live and and where you're at like in the world and those types of things it will always affect how you tell stories like having a kid will affect you telling stories it would probably get you more comfortable having kids in films and, and like yeah a lot of things changes through life and and your style will change but some things will be consistent <clears throat> yeah that's my thoughts on it anyway <clears throat> how would you define your style um uh, i got this question um i would say this is so hard some form of i don't know moody scandinavian cinematic uh, but also like organic realness <laughs> to it <laughs> bad explanation but that's what i got uh yeah okay so let me see i had some other links as well here that i brought up but that was my kind of reply to Mari uh, in terms of how you find your style uh, uh, okay so this <laughs> I won't go on forever in this one but uh, improve your creativity so these news things that I'm talking about today is from F stoppers this one is improve your creativity and test yourself by shooting water and I think it's true in like many ways. You can work so much with with developing your talent for how to expose an image. Like when you have the dynamic range of water, it's super difficult to expose those things. So playing with that, you can really get a sense of what you have to work with. I like underexposing my images. I love that. I love that type of... Uh, style that you get uh, in the blacks when you underexpose but you need to have a camera that can handle that for you to do that otherwise you need to crush the blacks which is also an, an option but uh, yeah it it is a practice that i think most people should do i had to go on like this um, shoot for eight days on a cruise uh, doing a tv show a couple of years back and you really develop a, a certain type of style from like shooting it for a while you realize how the reflections act and, and all those things and I think that's a good practice so now that the water is out go out shoot some water uh, yeah so let me see if I got a question I can mix this up with how long did it take to make a living from filmmaking hmm I mean when I got out of film school and I went to a shitty film school, just so you know. Um, I started a company straight away. We had some form of, because uh, we live in a socialist country, we had, at that time, I don't think it's the same now, but you could get support for like six months or something to start your company. So we did that. Uh, we had that, it was me and another guy. We started that company and that kind of kicked it off and we sustained ourselves straight away from just doing filmmaking um, and photography but we did that for about I guess three years or something and then we made a film that got into Cannes uh, but then I went bankrupt and then I put that company to rest and then I had to get like second jobs and then I started off like you know went bankrupt had to start all over started a new company myself and then i had to work extra to kind of pay the bills for a while did that for probably a year and then i kind of built that company up much more stable so i had more money laying uh, on a like i deliberately chose to have like okay i need to have six months of pay uh, in savings just to be able to be more comfortable in taking the right decisions yeah. But the first three years when we had the first company, that was just like hustling, doing all crappy type of filmmaking jobs that you could do. But we also came, I came from studying graphic design with a lot of people that went into the advertising industry. So a lot of my friends that I studied with, but like two years, like I continued after I studied with them. I studied film for three years, no, two years. Uh, so they had already established themselves in the uh, industry in terms of like having some 
projects and being like art directors and that type of stuff. So I could get some jobs in advertising through them. Then I also did a lot of freelancing. We did like shitty music videos and all these things. Yeah, but that really taught me how to be a DOP. And uh, then from that, I started a new company. I made Zero Silence uh, with that company. And on the side, in the beginning, I worked extra just to kind of build a buffer. Uh, which I can recommend to anybody that want to start something like build a buffer for like six months to a year to have that pay saved up because that will make you take the right decisions and not stress into things because otherwise it's so easy to just take the first job that you get and now that we're we're three people in our company now now it's much more difficult because now like you have so much more uh, that you're pretty much forced to take jobs as they come in sometimes yeah, not all the time but sometimes that's the situation you're in and I don't like that situation so I would avoid it if you can um, yeah um, but it didn't take long um, okay so let me see next news item so and, and this is going to be mashing things up but Industry news roundup and AI in photography was something that I saw. And I just wanted to touch base on this artificial, aid, uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality and my thoughts on it. Because I haven't really talked about it. Because yeah. for a while I was about to get signed to uh, like an agency yeah, or like a management type of agency. Yeah, that did both virtual reality and um, filmmaking and I, that was like okay so I want to test virtual reality and do that whole thing but then like the years went on because this was like a year and a half or so ago and I've just lost like the, all the interest in it so let me know what you guys think but I think this is the problem that I have with all artificial intelligence and all of that when it comes in terms of supporting you as a filmmaker then I'm all for it but the thing is that I don't want somebody else to tell the story automatically like maybe that works for some things but for the most part storytelling has always been from one perspective that's what makes it unique that's what makes it a story it's when it's being told through one perspective and sure i like playing video games that you immerse yourself into a story but the story is shit compared to other stories it's the experience that you like it's not the story like games with the strong story mm, hasn't existed as well as like I've experienced it as, at least not at all like the artistic type of stories because it's, it's just too massive like the world's become too complex and it's so hard to grasp it you need somebody to guide you and that's what art is all about like somebody guiding that's what I feel about like virtual reality it doesn't really have a place I feel um, long term now it has because it's exploring and all that and I mean, all the stuff, like I've seen one thing that I was super impressed with. And that was uh, the Cirque du Soleil, which was like a, go away, which was a, it was a circus. It was Cirque du Soleil. All you do is you sit on the floor of the circus or is it? Yeah, it's a circus, right? So, and then they interact with you. And the thing is that it works because it's an experience. You sit on the floor close to the people, they talk to you, they come around you. It's that whole immersiveness is amazing. There's really nothing like that. When you have people that are interacting with you, talking to you, it, you feel more alive. I love that. But then all the docs that I've seen, like I've been to a lot of festivals watching the docs, virtual reality docs, for instance. I have trouble like seeing the point because the narrative is so limited uh, and you're supposed to be immersed in this but so let's say you're thrown into uh, Heishi or, or like you're in the I saw one that was about the Ebola crisis for instance 
And I mean, it's decent. It's a, it's a story that kind of works, but it doesn't impress you in any way. It's just like, oh, okay, so you get to see this experience firsthand and you get to immerse yourself in it, but it doesn't add anything that a film maker couldn't add, that couldn't, you know, tell a story that's stronger than that, that you feel more from. And that's what it's all about, feeling more. I have issues with that. I don't see it yet. Maybe it will come, but right now I don't see how it's uh, like getting me to feel more. What do you guys think? Um, but that's just my thoughts on, on, on that whole thing. Uh, why do you do YouTube? Well, mainly because I see it as a way to create a platform where I can be independent. Like I want to be an independent filmmaker for real. People aren't independent in any way that does independent films. They're totally dependent on studios and, and having all that. I want to have this channel become something that can sustain the films so that the films I make, they become a part of the channel, but this also creates revenues in different ways. So I've seen like my uh, artistry as a filmmaker much more so as a, uh, like a musician would see their music like as a tool to make money or to sustain themselves in different ways than just releasing a record, selling a record. I don't see my filmmaking that way. I don't think I will make any money off of my films or I don't expect it. I think that sure you can get like, you can probably go even out on a project or something like that, but you will never get rich or you will never get a stable income in a sense that you can do whatever you want. So I've seen this as like, okay, so if we can create an educational platform that then can kind of, we can set aside an amount of money that goes to creating good content and storytelling around it. So we based it on my story as a filmmaker just because we wanted to make it close and personal. So the story is that we're moving towards and, and it's actually changing a lot now the coming months, much more so towards like my experience. So first now we're running this part of a series that we're, we're trying to change up the tutorials to be more, um, more a mix of like tutorial learning and uh, vlogging and documentary and cinematic storytelling in one because we feel like it's much more effective and that's what you seem to gravitate towards when you watch the channel even when you watch the analytics and all that you see that these are the ones that have the retention so we don't see that for the long form stuff but we do see that when we look at the course that we release we see that it has crazy amount of retention so we don't see youtube as the platform for uh, like deeper learning uh, you have like the base of YouTube being okay, so you can search for tutorials, but most people want it quick uh, and they don't want to sit for hours learning stuff. What they do want though is the personal stories and to have a connection with the creators and, and kind of feel their lives and how they are making things. So that's what we're gravitating towards, I think, to show like YouTube channel being much more towards showing behind the scenes documentary. Uh, of like how we make uh, advertising, how we uh, do the next uh, feature film and then showing that like we're starting with the feature film in a couple of weeks uh, starting to show uh, how we're making it and then that's going to run on for like until the film is made and after probably long after it's going to be you know showing every step of the way but in a more documentary way and not so much like tutorial okay this is how I sold my film to Netflix and then talking about it. No, much more trying to catch it as it happens, showing it in a narrative uh, way and not uh, talking and explaining it in that sense. Because we feel like those works the best. Like we will still have like the tutorial based uh, stories, but it's going to be told in a more cinematic and, and narrative way. So not be so uh, like long outdrawn and, and all that because it works much better in the courses uh, but then on top of that we also do like shorts that are more uh, just showing some form of uh, uh, like vision or, or 
story or whatever it can be so we mix that with those that are more like behind the scenes feely uh, and then sometimes it's going to be tutorials and all that but uh, i think the q a lens is much more to like having direct questions about things and, and that works much better as a format i think uh, than the long drawn tutorials um, and when we can get that working, when we can get this ecosystem working with like education, you have sponsors coming in because it's a massive channel, <laughs> if that ever happens. Uh, but we, all, we do get sponsorships already. Like we get sponsored for the next film and doing behind the scenes for that. So we're, we're at that stage where we're getting sponsors. It's, it's not that we can live off it. So when we get to that stage, then this is going to be amazing. But then we also do advertising and we will continue to do that and now we're launching series about that so we've shot and we got in our contracts for everything that we've done for the past year and a half or so we've always written the contracts so that we can use everything we shoot as uh, the youtube channel so we'll break down everything that we do like how we've done it we've had behind the scenes uh, photographers on set shooting all that so we had a lot of material shot uh, to kind of break that down and tell a story around it and the first thing is now we're running a series uh, about and the next episode comes out tomorrow I think it's going to be like a three-part thing for now it's going to continue later on but it's going to be um, why I think advertising is dying and how I think it should evolve that type of thing uh, we released the last episode or the first episode last week but then on top of that we're going to talk about like how do you pitch an agency and how do you work with the client those types of things uh, so we will have that story going on and then on top of that we will have uh, those type of uh, tutorials slash behind the scenes based uh, stories which you will kind of get a feel for how it is in real life rather than somebody just talking because there's so many people that can talk about like okay this is how it's being done da, da, da. but i feel like not a lot of people is showing you how it's being done on location and, and all that so the first episode uh, about like how to pitch an ad agency takes place in Ålesund, norway so it's like super spectacular shoot that we went on last year uh, and then we just made that this week and yeah it's gonna be amazing um, guess that answer the question I hope so though uh, let's see okay so I had another news item here I like these lists six pieces of the studio kit I use every day so I'm gonna elaborate on this so flags and reflectors when you do docks I rarely use flags or reflectors just because practically it doesn't really it lends itself to like it's really hard to have that set up and and just like i don't do it it's just too complicated i do use lights a lot and all that but i've worked a lot in studios and i've worked a lot with reflectors and flags and they are essential if you want to light things um, like super crucial so I can recommend them but the thing is that when you're not in a studio situation you have a really hard time doing it and I think it's awesome when I have a gaffer that can run around with a reflector that's awesome I love those shoots it happens all the time for the advertising stuff that I work like that but when you want to do running gun type of documentaries or when you want to do low budget filmmaking I think working with the natural light like moving subjects or moving you as a camera operator in a way that you work with the light is a much more crucial part of it to learn uh, and learning how to kind of work with that and then I usually because this is the simplest way for me to control the light either you want to take out light so you want to cover windows or something or you want to use the windows or whatever light you have like behind me 
Yeah. And then you want to bring the light in the room up or you just want to light the face uh, or person that you're following just to kind of set uh, an exposure correctly on them. But the rest of it has to come from the environment. That's how I work at least for, for docs. Super clamps. If you don't know what a super clamp is, you should buy one right now. They are used for everything for me. Like I put stuff in the ceiling. I brought one to put on my bike uh, when I was riding with my kid the other day. I put it when I got to the place. I put uh, like a ball head on top of it. So I used it as a tripod, just putting it on stuff, on a boat, on uh, all different stuff. Like super clamps are crucial in how I work. I think they are an essential tool in any filmmaker's kit. It should be, at least one should be in your bag at all times. Uh, you can put lights up, you can put reflectors, you can put like, anything up. USB cables. Let me talk about cables in general. You should have a cable bag. You should have them organized neatly with uh, like Velcro uh, around them. Uh, and you should have them in a bag or case of some sort that is transparent so you can see them easy to kind of find the stuff when you need it super important to me like organize your cables have all the cables for everything that you need um, yeah paper rolls yeah like the ones that are for like backdrops i have one there with a green screen I would like to buy more of those. I love working with them, but I don't think they're a necessity. It's much more that they are used in photography and that sort of thing. But like, I would like more colors and, and all that. But I mean, it also becomes kind of boring to have that backdrop. It can be nice, but yeah, mm, not a huge fan. Compressed air. That is something everybody needs. Cleaning out stuff, pumping things. Blowing your hair dry, no, not really, but I use a compressor for a lot of things. That's a necessity as well. If you have the place, you don't need it. You cannot carry it in your bag, or you could actually, but yeah, I, I wouldn't. Um, coat hooks. I don't use them so much, but sure, they can be essential if you want to hang stuff uh, anywhere. Yeah. So let me just find the next question. Where do you get your knowledge from? YouTube tutorials, practical filmmaking. Most of the stuff I just learn from being uh, uh, like out doing stuff, working. Most of the stuff I just learn from seeing how things are being made. Like for instance, how do you uh, roll up a cord? Okay, so I saw that uh, on location. How do you uh, anchor a tripod? So that on location, like you hire, if you're a newbie and don't know how to work lights in a studio, you hire a gaffer and then they know that. And then you just watch how they do it and then you do the same. So you need to be observant and, uh, and kind of take things in all the time um, and be open to learning things and, and all that. Um, that's mostly how I learn and YouTube tutorials. Like when I know what I need to learn, I go on YouTube and I search for it. I don't read a lot of tutorials, but then I also do audiobooks for like deeper learning. I read a lot of books or listen to a lot of books. That's a dilemma. What should you call it? Is it reading or isn't it reading? Old people claim it's not. I claim it is though. You get intelligent by it. Yes, you do. But that's how I learn, I think. And also talking to people and listening to people and also making documentaries. Like all the stuff that I've made, I've learned so freaking much from the subjects that I've chosen. I've chosen subjects that I don't know much about just because I want to learn things as well. Like I'm interested in it. So the next film is about like environmental or climate change. I don't know that much about it. Like I don't have any deep knowledge of it, but I have like a curiosity in trying to find out. I know that I don't want to put shit food in my stomach and that type of thing, but uh, I mean, I, I'm not that type of uh, activist. 
So I just want to make a film about people and then explore the topic. So that's usually how I go about learning things. So you, you try to meet people, you try to learn things from yeah, different uh, cultures and, and all those things. And that's probably how I learn the most. Mm, let's see. How do you market yourself as a filmmaker? Or did I miss one before that? Okay, so I need to go back for another one. But this one first then. How do you market yourself uh, as a filmmaker? Like it's pretty hard to get people to notice you if you don't make stuff. I think the best way to market yourself is to make stuff. Uh, if you can make stuff. Um, then that's the like easily the best way to get uh, seen is to make stuff that gets exposure so then you need to make the type of projects that are um, like getting exposed the right way and if you aren't getting that like if you aren't getting exposure then you probably aren't either doing the right things to get to that place where you get the exposure or you're um, in a kind of situation where you're not making stuff that is interesting <laughs> enough and then you need to focus if that's the case then you need to focus on like learning practicing more that's the only way that you can kind of get to that stage because you need to create projects that are being picked up and being seen and being shown and like when we do stuff for like clients and just in general people show those things to other people as references or that type of thing and that's where you want to be you want to be the people that they take a video from and then show to the client or something like that or use to like portray a feeling in a pitch or something and then when you have that when you're the reference then you know that they will call you to also do that stuff so we try to be that and that's why we put out a lot of stuff as well um, not enough I feel like we should focus more on Instagram I think Instagram is amazing um, if you want to reach that type of people uh, and also uh, being like focused on having if you if you haven't yet had a short film that got Vimeo staff picked or something then that's something that you should strive for much more so than having like a, a festival premiere or something if you can get that, then you have a way into the industry. But then you got to develop from that and, and everything. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so I'm getting audio delay 10 seconds from the audio. Is everybody getting audio delay? Let me know. Uh, okay, so the other question I had was, who is your favorite YouTuber? Hmm. Trick question. Like I wanna, I, I would probably if I would just say it, I would say Casey Neistat. But I don't know if I wanna say that. Everybody would know that. I should probably say somebody else. Hmm. Let me check. Like. I can just run through a couple of them that I like. I like... Uh, I don't watch it all the time, but sometimes I love, for instance, what I think Justin Escalona is becoming as a filmmaker. Um, still very dependent on who he has as his friends in the house at the moment, um, but that I like. Um, L Mills I like now she <laughs> had a meltdown so now I don't know what's gonna happen there um, but she's super talented she's like super super talented um, who else I'm more much more looking at like entertainment than I am like learning stuff is mostly mostly based on what I search for um, I hope that Dan Mace is going to do, uh, like Dan the director was what it was called earlier when he actually did stuff on YouTube. Now that he's 
uh, working with Casey, I, I haven't seen anything. Uh, so that's kind of unfortunate because I think he's super talented. He's probably one of the most talented YouTubers out there. Uh, but he isn't making stuff. And that's usually how it goes. Like people that have the best talent, they're not productive at all. And they screw up for themselves in terms of careers because of that. They give too much to other people and, and they don't uh, focus on themselves enough. Now, I'm not saying that Dan is doing that because he is probably very elaborate about his decision working with Casey. But uh, I think that he's so talented that it would be a pity that he slows down this much. I think the advertising career for him did the same thing first because before he had like a he was doing well in terms of advertising for a while before that he was super productive on youtube and i guess that was the way that he got the advertising gigs and this is something that i see a lot too for documentary filmmakers they make like a one one film they get a lot of advertising gigs they don't know how to sustain themselves so they get like hooked in the advertising world and they don't make more films so they can't kind of have things going uh, because they get sucked into that because it's easy to get that but you have to be consistent and, and I feel like a lot of people that do YouTube they drop off because of that Ben Brown did the same I liked what Ben Brown did uh, but it also was a little bit like repetitious uh, so I liked it much more when he did it uh, now I don't know how often he does it but I feel like he did it uh, on his trip that he did recently through Africa, um, that was a good way for him, I think, to do it. Because it was not like daily, but it was enough that you would be interested in seeing it. And it was a journey. And I think the journey part of, uh, of the, um, the vloggers that I see is what's interesting when they go on journeys. But they have a hard time telling a story if they are not on a journey. So they struggle to tell stories from nothing. But as soon as they are experiencing things, then it's easy to kind of just shoot it. Uh, and I think that's where I would like people to develop into. So I don't have a favorite YouTuber outside of Casey um, because people aren't talented enough for keeping me interested on like every video they put out. So I like what uh, a lot of people that do educational content but it's so dependent on what the topic is, if I'm going to click on it. And that's what I don't like about it. That, okay, so you follow somebody, but then, or that's not what I want my channel to be. So that's what we want to move away from. So to be more focused on having a personal story and personal narrative, rather than it's focused on like search, which it was for a while on this channel. It was focused on like, Okay, so these tutorials say this, this search is coming in. Da, da, da. Sure, that's a way to grow, but what audience are you growing and would they stick around for what you want to do in the end? I don't think so. So we try to kind of work the retention instead around um, like what we want to do. Um, and then sharpen that until we like hit home run. Um, yeah, that's probably... Is there anybody else? There should be somebody else. At some other time, maybe. Okay, let me see. Okay, so nobody said if it's lagging. So I'm guessing it's not. Uh, have you had any experience with Swedish YouTube networks? I have. We were signed to... Um, oh my God, blank. United Screens until very recently. And my thoughts on it is that it's unnecessary. Just like with agents and, and all these things, they're totally useless until you're on a level where you're self-sufficient. So when you actually are making money, you are an established name, then they can boost that and they can put a lot of like the work that you don't have time to do, selling, pitching, all those things. They can do that. But when you're a smaller YouTuber, like under probably 100K or something, they don't do anything worthwhile. Uh, and especially if you're um, 
like us a bit older time of type of niche that isn't super sweden centric then you're also going to have like a struggle being on a network in sweden i would love if like there was more youtubers that did the same type of stuff that we did that we could collaborate with in sweden but there isn't a lot of people that are uh, in like a decent size and consistent and doing stuff um, that's kind of hard i think in norway they seem to have like um, around like Marcus Valor and like Mio and th those type of people they seem to have like a, a clique of people that actually can kind of boost each other and grow together in Sweden we don't really have that unfortunately so if you Swedes out there are planning to do something serious on YouTube and do plan to stick around then that would be amazing but at this point it feels like it's just like okay so Jon Olsson does it in Sweden but he's on a different level than we are at so it's kind of hard to collaborate with him uh, and around our size it's really hard to find somebody that's doing something in English first of all that's really rare in in Sweden even though everybody speaks English somehow they choose the Swedish language um, and I guess for some people that makes sense but for us it never did because we work internationally and we have like all our films are in English so we don't do a lot of stuff that isn't uh, tailored towards an international audience yeah but that's just like my thoughts um, but outside of Sweden, I I can say this: all the people that I work with that has been on a network um, say the same thing as I do. Like they're useless if you're not huge, or they're useless if you also have a system set up for everything. But they can be a boost if if you in a situation where you can't kind of handle everything and you don't have the time and you want to relieve some time and you want to use them but you need to be at a certain stage uh, as a youtuber to get support from them otherwise they won't care about you they won't prioritize you over other youtubers unfortunately uh it's lagging badly okay that sucks so because of that i'm probably gonna cut this short and I'm going to upload this one separately because uh, I don't know why, why it's lagging. I thought I shut everything off. But either way, last question. Or let me just get like the last news thing that I had first. Or did I have another one? Nope. Okay, so last question. Should I keep my Nikon DSLR or get a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K when it comes out? I would say Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. I heard, like, there was somebody else asking about uh, the pocket, last pocket, this pocket, should you upgrade? You should definitely upgrade. If you want to get a second hand type of camera, then the Pocket Cinema, uh, last one, is a really amazing choice. It's still a great camera. But if you want to have something that is like cinema quality that has good ergonomics, light sensitive, proper audio, all those things, then the new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is the thing to have. But if you want to vlog, you need that flip screen. You really do. Like I see it as a big, big miss of them not having that they're missing a huge potential in market just because of that screen and i get it you want to have it a certain way you yeah optimized for that but don't show it off as a vlogging camera then that's just like hitting yourself basically so the people that will vlog with it will be like more cinematic focused they will really care about it but I don't think that it's going to be that different from the GH5S in terms of like quality and everything. So a vlogger would probably pick that. And you have autofocus on it. That usually works pretty fine now with a hack. Autofocus on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera not going to be good. That's an issue. If you care about that, then don't get that camera. 
if, but for anything else, image quality, codec, codec, codec. <laughs> oh, like the joy of editing in progress. It's like three times or five times as fast to render and stuff. And of course, it's more smooth to edit. That I care about. And for that, you have the pocket cinema camera being like a deal breaker, I think, for me. Um, I think, like, I will get that camera. Will I use it for vlogging? I'm not so sure because there is a comfortableness in having uh, a housing that's uh, like all weather durable that the GH5 is. The stabilization in the GH5 is also amazing when you have dual stabilization. The small lenses and then the stabilization in it, that's pretty amazing. So, and then the autofocus. And even if you don't use the autofocus uh, as like a continuous focus, but just having it focusing easily is worthwhile. Those things I think will make it difficult for me to only use the Black Mac Magic Pocket Cinema camera. But for anything that is filming, uh, like if I shoot a documentary, then I'm definitely using that one as a B camera over the GH5. Yeah, but it, with the GH5S, if I had that, then it would probably be different. Because um, like I like it being all round. But I also like the stabilization so much because that makes the kit so much smaller. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then we got that question. I think I answered that one. Yeah. GH5S or Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. It totally depends on what you need. Image quality wise, probably the same. But if you look at processing, like in the time that you gain from having ProRes, I would pick, you know, the 4K Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera any day over the, um, the GH5S, just because of the fluidity in editing and post-production. But then for uh, vlogging, probably the GH5S. That's probably, yeah, it makes most sense. Okay, this is going to be it. I'm going to upload this one because uh, audio lagging sucks but until next time bye bye